Amen. All right, uh, we are in a series called Let There Be Light, and we're going through the Bible's perspective on light um, and like basically checking out how that, that fuses and dovetails with the message of Christmas. Um, and I, I just want to, this is one of the coolest things. I love that this church is a church where we have people showing up that are really young, somewhere in the middle, and really old. And so if you're really old, own it, man. Just own that old. And if you're really young, own that. Because we love that this is a church that gathers together. It's not a uh, old church or a young church, a cool church or a lame church. We're, we're just like a, a mixed bag of weirdos. And we love coming together and worshiping Jesus together. And this is one of the things that took place last night that I thought was so cool. This 10-year-old named Charlotte, this is her notes. Like she's an artist. Like I, I, as, as someone who loves art, I like, I love that. So whenever I see people bring in their Bible, we, we encourage you bring your Bible so that you actually can see stuff in your own, that your own text and you color in your Bible and you underline stuff that for a visual learner like me, that helps me. But if you're like someone likes notes, we provide notes. But um, if you're someone that likes just like doing this, I encourage you bring a sketchbook and draw it. My only thing is this, if you draw in church, I got to see it at the end because I just, I just, I mean, I'm curious, but I just loved how Charlotte uh, did such an awesome job of taking, this is basically the sermon, so take a snapshot. Okay, now we're moving on. We're, going, we're in John, we're in two passages of John. We're starting in John chapter one, which is what we did last week. Um, and actually, just as a, a spoiler, we're, we're starting in January, we're starting a three month long series in the gospel of John. So we're just going through the gospel of John all the way through. And uh, we're, we're cheating that series a ton in this series just because there's so much that John has to say about the subject of light, but it's all cool. We're going to go ahead and read. We're going to pick up. We just did the first five verses last week, but we're going to go ahead and uh, take verses four through 12 and then jump on over to chapter nine. So if you've got your Bibles, you got those open, please stand. We're going to go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. And again, this is John. This is, this is one of the disciples that was the youngest disciple. He outlived all the other disciples. Um, he was one of the few that died an old man in prison um, and not dead at 40. And so that was, that was something that was pretty remarkable, remarkable about his account. And I just feel so privileged that we get a chance to have this eyewitness account of Jesus's ministry and life from a guy who wrote really not only accurate, but accurately, but poetically. And so we're going to start in verse four and read from there. It says this, in him, this is talking about Jesus, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. and Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. To, yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then chapter nine, we're just gonna look at verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So, if you look at the whole Bible, the whole Bible is filled with one primary message from Genesis to Revelation, okay? There's tons of authors, tons of books written over 1,500 years inside the Bible that is a collection of all these, but one message, and the message is called the gospel. And gospel just means what? Good news, yeah, good news. And that's like, it's interesting because you get some sketchy places in, Old Test in the Old Testament, like, whoa, that's good news. All of that is like this, like breadcrumbs along the way leading to Jesus. And so the whole book is all about good news. And if you wanted to just like distill down the message of Jesus's good news message, it's simply this. It's like two phrases. The first is, you're blind. And the second phrase is, I bring sight. You're blind. I bring sight. That's like the whole thing. Now, if you look at blindness, I mean, even this passage right here that Jesus said, I've come to bring sight to the blind. Um, I, I was just in researching this passage this week, I was looking through like, why is it, it feels like when you're reading the Bible, there's all these cases of people that can't see. Like how many of you wear glasses or contacts? Okay. So we're blind, right? But here's the thing. These people aren't like, I'm a little nearsighted. I need reader. No, these people are like blind, blind. Like, if you're sighted, you can see light. If you're blind, you see what? Nothing, darkness, right. And so like, that was a thing. And so I was trying to research what just, 
you know, anthropologically, what was going on, sociologically, what was going on that was causing such blindness? A lot of it was, uh, was a dietary um, insufficiency that caused things um, like all over, the, like a lot of the medical issues you see in the New Testament in particular was due to like really, really poor diets that, that they weren't getting the adequate amount of nutrients. And that also played into blindness. Another thing that some people said, and I'm not joking at all, that because people didn't wear sunglasses and they're in the Mediterranean area, the glare of that sun was just super, super, uh, just gnarly on their eyes. It just beat them up big time. And that factored in. There's also lots of cases of uh, flies carrying diseases that once they got into your eye, you went blind. So blindness, legit physiological blindness was a thing in the ancient world, not just in the Bible, but in the ancient world as a whole. The biblical authors pick up on that real physical reality as a metaphor, as a metaphor for what happens when we're separated from God or we're acting outside of God, that we could be not just blind, but spiritually blind. Because if you're physiologically blind, like I can make myself blind, okay? I, I could do something that could cause myself blindness, I can't do anything if I'm blind to make myself sighted. I can cause permanent blindness for the rest of my life. I can't do anything to fix that. And certainly the people in the ancient world could do nothing to fix that. And so what they saw was like this. They're like, okay, this is a reality. Um, if, you're, if you're someone who's disconnected from God, this is something that you do and you can't undo it. You're locked in, you're hopeless. There's nothing you can do. And so you have prophets like Isaiah and Zephaniah who use blindness, spiritually speaking, as this, this result of being a, a, like a, a rebel, a, in rebellion to God's way. Like, God, you've created me this way, but I'm choosing to go the opposite way. Therefore, I'm spiritually blind. You have Paul in the New Testament talking about those who are in rebellion to God are spiritually blind. They're in darkness. They don't see light. And, and so throughout the Bible, you see that reality being described as a good description of this disconnect from God. You have, you have Satan, who's the arch enemy of, of God all throughout the Bible, and he is the prince of darkness. You have hell describing as a place, if someone says, I declare my independence from you, God, I don't want your forgiveness, I don't want your way, there's like this disconnect that isn't just in this lifetime, but it's eternal, and that that is a place of darkness. And so darkness is this, this, again, this consistent thing that is all over the Bible as a result of this disconnect from God, but it gets worse because it's not just those people over there or that guy over there or the jerk down the street or that teacher that I can't stand. Like this darkness, this spiritual blindness is universal. Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you've got like a terrorist to Mother Teresa in the same boat as far as being disconnected from God in darkness and hopeless. This is a no-win situation. All are going to die because of this disconnect from God. Now, that's not good news. That's the beginning of the good news. It's the reality that we are blind. We are stuck in our blindness, and there's nothing that we can do about it, which, of course, brings us to Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. The best of all the movies. Okay, now some of you may have grown up in a Star Wars family. And some other of you guys may have grown up in Star Trek families. My family was bipartisan. And so we like, we loved them both. My dad did a good job as a father raising us on both Star Wars and Star Trek. And this one is the best film. I saw this when I was like five and I got scarred from this film. And if you saw the film, you know exactly what scarred me, but it was, okay, so it's, but in the end, you've got Captain Kirk and Spock and the rest of these guys. And this guy right here is Khan, played by Ricardo Montalban. And Ricardo Montalban, he actually was in the series back in the 60s. The movies came out in the 80s. This is a throwback to one of the episodes back in the 60s when Kirk and the rest of his crew on the Enterprise go up against this space bandit, this criminal in space called Khan. And they ultimately win at the end and they put him, they exile him to this planet and everything's all good. This movie, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is how Khan got away from that planet and seeking revenge against Kirk. Dum, dum, dum. And that's the plot of the film. That's not how the film starts. The film starts with Captain Kirk and Spock overseeing an exercise for a cadet in the Federation. It's an it's a, it's a exercise that all the cadets have to go through. And the, the exercise is a simulation. It's called the Kobayashi Maru test. And the Kobayashi Maru test is simply this. When placed, when a cadet is playing captain in this simulation, what if you give them a scenario that's hopeless? 
where no one is going to win. No one is going to live. Everyone's going to die. They want to present that cadet in a, cap, a potential ca captain situation to see how do they respond if all are going to die and there is no hope. That's the purpose of the exercise. Nobody passes the Kobayashi Maru test. Everybody fails. Everybody, except for this guy, the smug Captain Kirk. Now he's smug throughout the whole series. Why? Because he's a playa. Now, if you've ever watched Star Trek, you understand that. But he's also smug in particular in this particular film for one reason. Again, nobody has passed the Kobayashi Maru test. It's you're bound to fail it. There's only one person in Federation history that passed it. Guess who that was? This guy. How did he pass it? He cheated. He hacked the Kobayashi Maru system. And the reason that he hacked it and later on brags about the fact that he cheated is because Captain Kirk says, I don't believe in no-win situations. I don't believe in no-win scenarios. And later on, he admits, I've never truly had to face death. Until you get to the end of the movie. And all of a sudden, you've got this massive dogfight. This is a painting of the event because the actual 1982 graphics and special effects were garbage. But you got Khan on the USSS Reliant going up against the Enterprise, and it's a dogfight, man. They're like just smashing the snot out of each other. And the Reliant looks like it's going to be totally taken out, but all of a sudden, it just, just goes to town on the engineering se uh, section of the ship. That causes the inability for them to jump to warp speed, which, as we all know, is 4.1 billion miles per second. They can't do that, which is, I mean, they're kind of dead in the water, but it gets worse because Khan hits a self-destruct button that's going to cause this nuclear blast that everyone is going to die. There is no hope. The Enterprise is toast, and 100% of the people on board are going to be lost. The Kobayashi Maru test has now gone from hypothetical to reality. There is no hope unless they get the warp drive fixed, but the, the chamber is filled with radiation, and the only, there's, so there's no way a person could go do, and do that without being totally destroyed, which leads to Captain Spock coming to that conclusion on his own. And without telling anyone, he sprints down to the engineering room. They try to stop him, but he pushes through. He goes into the highly radiation room, locks himself into it. He takes this cap off, and he actually goes into it to fix the warp drive by hand, getting exposed to billions of doses of lethal amounts of radiation energy. And just at that moment, it gets fixed, and they're able to jump to warp speed, and they get out of there. The Reliant explodes, but it doesn't impact the Enterprise because... Spock did it. He fixed it. Kirk has no idea that this happened. He's excited. He's ecstatic. Scotty down in engineer must have fixed it. And so he calls down to Scotty. He says, congratulations, Scotty. You did it. He says, Captain, you better get down here. So Kirk sprints down there and all of a sudden he realizes what happened. And he tries to get in there. He's like, he's going to die. And they say he's already dead. He wasn't. He was seconds away from death, but he was dying. And then Spock says something that as a five-year-old, I remember just like, it just landed on me heavy. But he says, I never took the Kobayashi Maru test as a cadet. I never took it until now. What do you think of my solution? Spock's solution was this. In a scenario where all are going to die, the only solution is for one to die so that all else could live. One dies for the benefit of others. Now in film, non-Christian film, pop culture, whether it's literature or movies, that's called something. And the term for that is called a Christ type. Who's the Christ type in, the, in this particular narrative? So it could be a, a totally non-biblical, unchristian movie. But if there's someone that recognizes a situation where all are lost, unless that particular character gives up their life for the good of the, the rest, that one dies for the good of all, that is called the Christ type. And here's the cool thing. People can look at that in the abstract, in narrative, in film. But if you're a Christian, that's your story. Because Jesus conveyed that. You are blind. You are dead in the water. There is no hope. All hope is lost. Death is going to consume everything. But your blindness is not the end of the story. You are blind, but I give sight. One will die for the good of all the rest. That's the Christ type we see, not in narrative, but in reality. And if you go back to John, the, the passage that we looked at at the very beginning, we see the light of God impacting us. 
And the target of that light is who? Everyone. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. So just as much as death and the effects of spiritual blindness are universal, all of us, 100% of us, are disconnected from God. A lot of us, we could look back at choices we've made, we could, we could see that. But even before we made choices, we could say that we were just tainted and disconnected. As much as that was a universal thing, so is the target. The invitation is for everyone. And you may be here and you're like, look, I wouldn't identify as a Christian. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a super tolerant atheist, or I'm an open-minded agnostic, or I'm just a hostage here. That my, my, I'm here with my mom. She makes me come. Whatever. I, let me just talk to you first off. You might have said, I don't think I could ever see myself or identify as a Christian. And I hope you're honest about that. You don't have to fake that. But the truth is, is that I want to just communicate to you that the Bible says this is not just for you. Because again, sometimes we think that to be a Christian, you had to grow up in a home that really modeled that, or you have to have, you know, maybe higher morals than other people, or maybe you, you just get things in the Bible. Whereas when you're looking at the Bible, like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This is not just for one particular group of people. The life was the light of all humanity. The target is everyone. And you might say, okay, I get that for most people, but there are things that I have done that cannot be forgiven. I haven't forgiven them. And I did it. I, I can't forgive myself for these things. How in the world could God do that? Well, that's because the power of the light is total. The light shines in the what? Darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So if you were like to write down privately the worst, most shameful thing that you've ever done, and you're just like, I, you write it down on a piece of paper, and you fold it up really quick because you would never want anyone to see this. Like, what is that for you? The thing that you are the most ashamed of, or the thing that you walk with guilt from, or you couldn't tell, you couldn't tell your family about it. Maybe you couldn't even tell a close friend, but you, you've got those things. Whatever that is, if, you, if that comes across the radar of your mind where you're saying, I would love to follow this idea of God in Jesus, but I've got serious baggage. The message of the Bible, the good news is, yeah, you're right, you're blind. But here's the thing. This is for you and its power is total. There's not a single thing that you could be ashamed of that is more powerful than God's forgiveness to you through Jesus. Not a single thing. Not even a collection of things. Not even a lifetime of things that could be so overwhelmingly heavy that it's going to outmatch the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. To which you might be saying, that sounds good, but like, I'd love to be spiritual. I've got friends that are spiritual. I mean, maybe that's the thing. Should I just like, like become a little more spiritual? And like, no, no, this is actually, it's way more narrow than that. It's way more focused. Check this out. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the baptizer, okay? He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. Okay, now this is super important. A lot of people, they want to get close to God and so they start like, like they'll like follow their priest or they'll follow their pastor or they'll like follow some like celebrity Christian's book that's super good or listen to their podcast. And these things can be helpful, no doubt. But the, I love that the Bible says, no, 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 this is exclusively, it's not through a spiritual leader. It's not through just you doing spiritual solo. This is like through one and only person, through Jesus. He came not only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The source of the light of God is exclusive. It is only through Jesus. I, I, I put it this way. I love this. Jesus is the most exclusively inclusive invitation in human history. Or let's put it the other way. Jesus is the most inclusively exclusive invitation in human history. The invitation is exclusively found through Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. No one comes to God except by way of me. Jesus didn't stutter. It is super exclusive. And yet, it is the most inclusive invitation ever. It does not care about your religion. It does not care about your geography. It does not care about who your parents were. It does not care about your skill sets. 
This invitation is for everyone. And that's why you find Muslims and Buddhists and atheists and Baptists all finding Jesus and giving their life to him and following him from whatever backdrop they came from. The source is the most inclusively exclusive invitation. It's for everyone. It's totally powerful. And it's, for, it's, for, it's through everyone. The next passage, next section says this. He was in the world talking about Jesus and through, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The light is a choice and the choice is ours. Now, if you've been a Christian a long time and you've read some of this book, you realize that God's sovereignty is proclaimed throughout this. It's pretty explicitly laid out that God has sovereign choice, that there's something about God's choosing us. It's a part of the equation. And I don't doubt that. I mean, it's there. It's, it's a fact. But it also doesn't take away from the fact that every single time in scripture that you see the gospel presented, it's presented as an opportunity for you to make a decision to either reject or receive forgiveness. It's not saying, I just want to tell you something. You may or may not be a Christian. We'll find out later. God only knows. We see instead consistently an invitation happen. The choice is yours. And so my question right now is like, no matter who you are, no matter who you came here with, what, have, what choice have you made on that? I mean, you chose what you wore today. You're making decisions right now about where you're going to choose to eat lunch today. We make choices all the time. With regard to Jesus, what choice have you made? Because a choice to make no choice is a choice of rejection. It's a choice of independence, to declaring independence. And the cool thing about this is that Jesus' communication primarily, exclusively and, and consistently is you're blind, but you could see. And that's only through me. But what's the result of that? Here's the result. The result is restoration. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now that may or may not mean anything to you, but let me just tell you what that means. The thing that you've been running after your whole life is not found in the things that you've been running after. We run after, we want to be, feel dignified and loved. And that's human and that's good. We want to find love in our, our family. We want to f find love in a, in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. We want to find love in a marriage. We want to find love in a friend group. These are good things. But when we look at that as our source of restoration, we are rapidly disappointed as soon as those people become human and fail us or we fail them and they react to that. For a lot of people, Christmas is so complicated because of that. It's like, I mean, it's like, man, I would, I, I, like we talked about last week, I would love, I would love for us to feel like this. Like you watch all the Christmas movies and it seems like the family always gets together at the end. Hallmark Channel Christmas movies for sure. Like you're like practically together, but within the first five minutes. But reality is different than that, isn't it? A lot of us, we roll into Christmas and we're just like, man, I see this happening on the movies. I see this happening with a lot of my neighbors and friends. As far as their family, they're coming together. This is such a good thing. But my family's been like, like this. It's just like, Ugh. or some of you, this is, this, is, this is the truth for some of you. Some of you, it was like this for a long time. And just recently, all of a sudden, this has started to happen. And that happens, we just thank God for that. But for me, man, for us, my, my extended family, like when we were growing up uh, um, as a kid in the McFadden family, I felt like we were like this. We're like, yeah, thank God. We're tight. I'm like, this is never going to change. And we were weird. We still are. We, we were weird then, but I'm like, nothing's going to affect this. And all of a sudden, all of us kids became adults and we kept on coming back every time. We're back here. Yeah, we're still weird, but yeah, it works. And about like 15, 16 years ago, a little bit longer than that, actually, this started to happen with some parts of that extended family of mine and stayed that way. I got more weird and more dramatic and more cold and awkward. And then about a year ago, this started to happen. And I was like, oh, this is the end of the movie. It's happening. 
And then about six months ago, from another part of the family, I'm like, what's wrong with you people? Come on! And I can't make it work. I've been running after that restoration my whole life, and you may have as well. A lot of us run after the restoration that's found in either your academic or your, like, the type of accolades you get from work, like your promotion and stuff like that. Like, I feel more of a valued person, a whole person, because people are, are giving me props. People are giving me, like, telling me I'm doing a good job. My grades are telling me that or whatever. And all those insecurities I felt as a kid are, are kind of being healed because I'm feeling some modicum of success. And that works until all of a sudden it doesn't. Some of us, it's, especially this time of year, it's, it's, sometimes it's, it's through what we're receiving. I, mean, I know that as soon as you get old, like, you know, it's not as much what you're getting, but you know it's still true. Like, you're still making Amazon purchases for you. You're still looking forward to that smiley box on your door, post, like your doorstep, and it's just smiling back at you. It's like, just, and you're just like, right? But the truth is this. As soon as you roll through Christmas Day and you're in a Christmas afternoon and the gifts are just kind of like all of a sudden they're starting to age as far as the joy that they're bringing. As soon as we roll into January, as soon as we just realize life, we realize that all those things that we were after in our restoration do not restore us. They do not fill us. They do not fulfill us. All of those are bound to disappoint us because none of those things, as good as they are, we're never the, going to be the source of our, the light in our life. Not our family, not our job, not our school, not our friends, not our popularity, not our skill set, not our cash flow, not our status. None of these things is the light, only Jesus. Do you have that? Do you have that light? Do you have him? What choice have you made on that? At this church, um, way, the way that we celebrate people who've made that choice, that said, I'm going to receive that forgiveness, is to do what, this weird thing that the Bible talks about as being baptized. If you've ever seen a baptism, it's just basically people getting dunked in public, which you did that as a kid, but now it's like spiritual. Like, what's up with that? And here's what's up with that. You're identifying with this amazing reality that I am dead. I am spiritually blind, but I'm connecting to the death of Jesus on the cross. And I'm not staying that way because Jesus didn't stay that way. I'm rising to life based on the power of his resurrection. Death has been conquered by him. It is no longer a factor for me. And so I'm gonna actually simulate that for people to let them know, to pronounce to them, I'm a Christian. This doesn't save me. Getting baptized doesn't save me. I'm pronouncing to you that I, I've been saved by Jesus and I want you to know about it. We baptized people about two weeks ago, about a dozen people on this campus and Morris campus. And you'll see um, people, um, we're gonna, we wanna show you those. Uh, and just uh, get, get you a chance to hear some of their stories. Um, you'll notice that um, Morris, if you wanna have a cool baptism, you gotta go to Morris because they get baptized in a horse trough, which is super cool. Um, but the thing that's so key is I want you to hear each of their stories. And I want you to do something weird. Um, when people get baptized at this church, what do we do as soon as they come up out of the water? We cheer. Now we're just watching video of it, but we're Mission Bible Church and we like to celebrate and we don't mind being dorks. And so what I want you to do is this, when people are coming up out of the water, let's applaud because that, if you're a Christian, that is a reflection of your story. Amen? All right, let's take a look. I'm getting baptized because uh, I feel like I want to walk away from my gas and I want to have the freedom that Jesus can give me. And uh, I walked my life without that for a long time. And it, it, you really do have freedom with Him. Yeah, I mean, I have that now. So that's why I'm doing it. That. I am getting baptized today. I grew up in the church. Uh, it's kind of always just like been the normal, I guess. And so from I guess the age of like four or five, like Spy Kids, little baby old me, like decided to follow Jesus, but I never really like fully knew what that meant. I've really come to know Jesus for myself. I have a similar story to her where I kind of grew up in the church and then I went to college and I walked away. And so it's kind of always just like every time it comes up, I, I'm like, okay, yeah, like I accept Jesus, like this is like what I'm doing, but I never really like fully knew what that meant until 
recently I like everyone gets baptized like gr around me and stuff but I was always kind of just like I want to like know when it's right and so um, I was baptized as a baby when I was born but I think it's important now as an adult um, to show my love for Jesus and to show my children and my family my love for Jesus and to make the choice on my own to follow Jesus. So I was also baptized when I was young right after I got saved but um, at the time I, I it was more of a um, like a next step thing but I don't think I really fully understand it as a as a child and uh, I believe God has been speaking to me this past year and this is a step that I want to take as an adult uh, that I understand what baptism is now and I want to be baptized and and just dedicate the rest of my life to God my mom started reading me Bible stories and then it made me thinking uh, who is this? And then we started reading more. And then I started saying, I'm gonna get back to this. So I was about six, seven years old. It's actually, uh, somebody asked me not too long ago, what was my earliest memory? And I, uh, that is really my earliest memory is when I got saved. Um, well, I was born into a Christian family and my preschool took place in a church. And I think it clicked around when I was like four years old. At uh, six, seven years old, I was out playing catch in the yard after church with my dad. And I started asking him about heaven and hell. And he took the opportunity to uh, take me into his bedroom and explain uh, how to get saved. And I prayed and asked Jesus into my heart that day. In April, my grandpa, who's outside, um, he had a health scare and we were going to pull the plug on his life support. And I was working in Chicago that day, um, walked all the way down from the 33rd floor down the stairs and ran face first into a church door that was wide open. And I don't think there's a more powerful sign that you could have gotten me with than, I mean, my grandpa's pretty much my dad. He's the closest like male relative that I have. And I went in and prayed for an hour. And I think for the first time, I really believed that praying would do something. And the next day he woke up and was talking and he's been healthy ever since. You know, I actually had an accident and I remember being in the hospital asking God to save me because I was basically bleeding now and I, um, I felt like he saved me right down there, so. I believe that God has saved my life in so many ways um, and I know that he will save my soul. Um, and it was one service that Pastor Errol, Errol said, he goes, you know, just pray every day in your car. On the way to work, just, just pray. It can be a conversation. Um, and I started having that conversation every day on my five minute commute to work. And I found him in my car. I was, I was talking to God and I found God. He answered me and that's why I'm here today. It came to a point where I not only started believing Jesus, but I started listening and following Jesus with my heart. Um, and I would say, in my car <laughs> was the time that I really started to follow Jesus. Last year at Trinity Christian School, during chapel, we were worshiping God and made the decision to follow Jesus. I'm getting baptized today because even though I'm not a perfect Christian, I do believe that the truth about Jesus changes everything and to show that I'm completely unashamed of my faith. Um, I'm getting baptized today to demonstrate to the public my following of Jesus Christ. I like had a come to moment where I was like, okay, like I feel ready. Like this is the time I want to fully make that decision.
Yeah. All right. Okay. So here's the thing. You know, like when you, you know, like if you've been on a really, really, really good vacation, you know, it's been a, a really, really, really good vacation because you get home and you're not just like, I'm glad that's done. But you like would actually be willing to turn around and go back and do it all over again. That's a really, really good vacation. That's exactly how I feel when I'm watching that. This is a, it's just like one of those amazing things. And so I just want to close you with this. This is the message of Christmas. And this is the message of Jesus. And it's simply this, be saved, be saved. That, that's the reality. The reality is, is that, that we are blind and now we receive sight. And so the, the action step is to be saved. And then, that, and then we see that in scripture. We see that when it says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. So the, the, the end of the story is not, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 24 says this, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. And so that's the message, be saved. The one thing that, that I wanna encourage you to, to walk out of here with is that reality. If you're someone that's in here that you would not identify as a Christian, then I want you to, to, to take the, the, the message of the gospel and simply respond. I wish that there was a, a cooler way to say be saved, but there's not. It's pretty churchy, it's pretty archaic, but it's descriptive of someone who's being rescued. You're being rescued from the darkness and you know better than I know for you, the darkness in your heart. Jesus can resolve that. He resolved that on the cross, be saved. If you're a Christian, I wanna encourage you. Here's your action step, be saved. You're like, I already am saved, good. That's awesome, now be that way, be that way. Allow the reality of the fact that God has allowed light to come into the darkness of your life. The fact that death is no longer your enemy. The fact that that's of all the garbage and complications of this world. You don't have to be the type of person that puts your head in the sand and says there's nothing bad going on. You actually get to have your head looking at the problems of life in the face. And you could say, that's painful. That's difficult. I wish that wasn't the case. And yet none of those things are the strongest reality over my life. None of those things impacts my psychology to the nth degree, because my nth degree psychology comes from my center and my core, and my core is the light that only comes through Jesus and nothing can take that away. And as fragile as human relationships are, nothing can break that relationship between me and God, nothing, not even me, not even me. Christians, be saved, flesh that out, live that out, walk that out. Let that reality inform your Christmas this year. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for being the light that didn't come to one ethnic group, that didn't come to one country, that didn't come to one time frame of human history, but you are the light for all of humanity. Lord, I thank you so much that as opposed to anything I could have done to merit or earn that, you authored that for me and for so many other people in this room. As we're praying, if that's not your story, I wanna encourage you simply as we're praying right now, just to do business with God. If you would never have identified as a Christian, but you want that light in your heart, that restoration, to become a children, a child of God, simply tell God that you know that you've been blind, blind to the darkness and in the midst of the darkness. Confess to him what that means. Confess to him what it is. And ask for his forgiveness. Ask for him to restore in you what you can't restore on your, on your own by what he did on the cross for you. And then ask him based on his resurrection, the fact that life is now part of the equation to walk with you through your life until your life is over and you get to see him face to face. Lord, for any of the people that are watching or that are in this room that have made that decision this morning, God, let them know that this is the day that they could look back to, that moment when they crossed over from death and darkness to life and light, and that you were the one that did it. Lord, I pray that you protect them, that you guide them from this moment on. And Lord, for the rest of us, that we've already made that decision, we've already received that invitation, 
Lord, I pray that you cause inside of us the ability to take steps that are bold steps of living out the reality of our salvation today and tomorrow, all the way through this holiday season and right into 2024, as we follow your lead into our homes, into the chaos and the dysfunction and the, the problems, and the chaos and the dysfunction, the problems at work, at school, in our friend groups, in our neighborhoods, and our families, and that we could enter into darkness as proud ambassadors of the light, the light of life, you, Jesus Christ. I will give you the thanks for it. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.